If you were with us last week, we sat under some, uh, some pretty heavy teaching, didn't we? When the, uh, when the man of lawlessness is revealed at the height of the rebellion, it will undoubtedly be unpleasant for us, the church. The, uh, the whole world will turn against us and hunt us. They will uh, suffer from a delusion, a willful and culpable delusion, but a delusion confirmed and strengthened by God himself even as he hardened Pharaoh's hard heart that God might show forth his glory and might in his triumph over him, so the whole world will follow the beast. But it will be brief, and whatever suffering it entails for us will not be worth comparing to the glory that is awaiting us. And that's what Paul turns his attention to this morning, if you have a copy of the scriptures with you, let me invite you to turn in them to Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. So the rest of the world is going to be caught off guard and brought under the spell of the evil one, but not us. We are a source. Well, the church at Thessalonica. Uh, was a source of great thanksgiving and praise for Paul. But I think the very same things can be said of us. Let's read what Paul says about us in 2 Thessalonians 2. We'll begin where we left off at verse 13 and uh, read to the end of the chapter. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this He called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. So you're different. We're different. I'm not excluding myself. We're different. And the difference between us and the world is we believe the truth. And those, those who don't believe the truth, they believe the lie from the father of lies. And um, the difference between us and them, and that's Paul's point here, the difference between us and them is not attributable to you or me. It's attributable to God. God is sovereign. Your salvation from beginning to end is a gift. Notice that Paul doesn't just say that he gives thanks to God for them. He says that it is right. He says that he has a certain obligation uh, to give thanks to God for them. And he explains the reason for that obligation. Words like because are very helpful, aren't they? I mean, as you work your way through the... the the Bible. Uh, but he's already, even before he tells us why with the because, he's already let the cat out of the bag. He's already given it away a little bit. Uh, even before you get to the because, look what he says. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, what? Beloved of the Lord. Paul says something very... Uh, he doesn't say, you who love the Lord... He says, you who are loved by the Lord, right? He says something very similar in Galatians 4, 9. He says, but now that you have come to know God, or rather, be known by God. How can you turn it back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? You see how he, you, you come to know God and he goes, really though, it's God knowing you. But in case that's too subtle, he gives us the because, makes it explicit. He ought to thank God for them because God chose them. He picked us. I remember, uh, 
I remember in elementary school being one of the last two ones, you know, picked for, for the, the kickball team. Uh, I also remember being picked first for a few things, uh, and I think most of us have a memory of that sort of thing. Um, sometimes, and I bet you remember this, sometimes it wasn't a matter of how good you were at kickball or whatever. Yeah, sometimes that would that would get you on the team if you were really good at kickball. That would get you on the team after all the friends had been picked. But you know, if you're the captain, first thing you got to do is pick all your friends, right? That's how it works on the playground, isn't it? Right? Uh, there was something validating about being picked, wasn't there? And there was something very humiliating about not being picked. Every time it would go around, it was a, another step in your humiliation, right? Well, here's the, the amazing thing about the gospel. There was nothing in you or me that should cause God to want to pick us. We weren't his friends. We were his enemies. And we certainly weren't particularly good at holiness. We were sinners through and through, born in rebellion against him. And his team's a holiness team. So he chose them to be saved through sanctification. He makes us holy. He declares us holy when we believe, but walking with Jesus is all about striving with all our might to live up to that calling. Saints, that is, holy ones. We are holy brothers and sisters, children of God, once rebellious slaves who have been loved and forgiven and who are being changed, who are learning to reject the lies and cling to the truth. None of us have arrived. We're all on the way. Now, what's the first fruits thing all about? Or if you have a different translation, I don't know how many translations are among us, but uh, you might see from the beginning instead of uh, as the first fruits. And either way, you probably have a a footnote offering the other translation as an option. Uh, It's a one-letter difference in the Greek. One letter. And, you know, we have lots of manuscripts to compare But as you compare them, it breaks out kind of evenly. So it gets really hard to decide this one. Um, And especially since both things are true. He chose us from the beginning, and he chose us as first fruits. He chose us from the beginning. Uh, What's the difference? Uh, And then I'll give you my opinion on it. Um, Paul very clearly tells tells us that he chose us from the beginning. even before Genesis 1, before he founded the heavens and the earth, this is what Ephesians 1.4 says. And you know, it's hard to quote a, a, a verse from Ephesians 1 because the sentence is so long. Um, but the whole thing is relevant to our discussion. So let, let me just read a chunk from Ephesians 1. Uh, I think it will help with our passage. Beginning in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in, heaven, in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will to the praise of His glorious grace which, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, His purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on the earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, 
were sealed with the holy with the promised holy spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it that's going to come up again so let me read it again <coughs> excuse me in him you also when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised holy spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So Paul very clearly teaches that God chose us before the foundation of the world. But did you notice that part at the end, what he said there about the spirit being a guarantee? That's what the first fruits were. So th this gets even harder because from the beginning and as the first fruits, they almost mean the same thing. You can read about the, uh, the, the ritual observance. There was a feast of first fruits, and you can read about that in numerous places in, in, the, in the law, but it's really just what it sounds like. You know, if you've ever grown a garden, you'll remember probably that some plants ripen before others. Some of the fruit is ready before most of the fruit is. And that's the first fruits. And when, it, when it's harvest time, that first portion, uh, it was offered to God as a holy portion of the harvest. But it's a portion of the whole harvest. We're, we're, it's kind of like when we, when we give, right? God gives us everything and we give him a piece, right? It, it's a very similar idea. And that's why Paul calls Jesus himself the, uh, the first fruits and first Corinthians 15, he says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are fall, have fallen asleep, the first fruits of the harvest. Well, there's going to be a general harvest when we will be included, but he's the first fruits. That's, he rose from the dead. We know the harvest is coming. You, understand, you see that, the imagery right there? For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Now, most pastors, uh, quite understandably, want to reserve that for Jesus, and uh, they tend to reject the ESV's translation here, and they tend to like the footnote. Uh, I'm not so sure. Um, listen to what James says. James 1.18, he says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. And... Um, we worked through Revelation not all that long ago. Here's what we read in chapter 14. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as firstfruits for God and the Lamb. Now, you may not agree with the way that I read Revelation, I, but I think this is a picture of the whole church, uh, men, women, and children included. Uh, it's just put under the imagery of a holy army ready for battle. But clearly, Christians, and not just Jesus, are referred to as firstfruits. And really, brothers and sisters, until we actually reach the resurrection harvest, and until Jesus returns with his mighty angels and sifts the chaff from the wheat or sorts the goats from the, from the sheep or, or, you know, collects the fish out of the net and throws out the bad ones, uh, whatever the imagery you prefer, until that day, any fruit belongs to the first fruits category. And that's because we have the Spirit as a deposit, a guarantee of our inheritance. Paul does write of that differently. In Romans 8.23, he calls that deposit itself the first fruits. Not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly await our adoption, adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. So we have that deposit, which is not only a guarantee, but it is, after all, the Holy Spirit that is within us, and so it is a sanctifying Spirit. And so if the Spirit is dwelling in you, and if you believe in Jesus Christ, He is. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you're not in Him. 
the Spirit is in you, it is going to be purifying you. And in your purification, you will learn more and more to rely on the Lord fully, rejecting the lie, growing in your love for the truth. To this, he called us through the gospel. So Paul thanks God for those who believe because God has begun a work in us and he will complete it. You will be like Jesus Christ and see him as he is. That's 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. We'll be transformed, Paul says, at the sound of the last trump. And that's, so that's what it means to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? To, to look like him. And is that not a good hope? That's how Paul's going to close this, this section with a benediction, and I'll use that benediction at the end of our service this morning. But he gave us a good hope through his grace. You know, I can't really fathom what it will be like when there is no sinful impulse in me. I certainly can't imagine a society where nobody is a sinner, but I, I can't even really get my head around what it will be like for me never being jealous, never being sad. We do have a good hope through grace. All of that belongs to this fallen and twisted generation, and it will be no more. We have an inheritance prepared for us. We have a sovereign Lord who is perfect and loving and just and merciful, and we have one another who are going through the hardships of this age together, who can share the hardship of swimming against the current of this culture. But all of this, all of this redounds to the praise of God. It lays an obligation on Paul to thank God for it, for what God, Paul sees God doing. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have anything to do with it. On the contrary, look what Paul urges them to do. Stand firm. To hold to the traditions that you were taught. And he specifies here the traditions that were taught by us, whether in person or in, in writing. Uh, what that means uh, is that he, he, he wants them to cling to those things that were taught with apostolic authority. What that means for us is believe what God tells you in your Bible and cling to the hope that he offers there. And when the culture makes it difficult to cling to that hope, God tells you to stand firm. Hold on to what you know. And then with apostolic authority, Paul blesses us, which makes this something of a, of a promise, doesn't it? He says, now, may the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. So that's the application, really. There's a work to be done. There are words to be shared. And God will establish our hearts in those things, and he will comfort our hearts as we cling to the truth. So... The application is stand firm and stand firm together as a body. And one of the ways that God comforts our hearts is by reminding us of the gospel. He does so uh, through the word of God, but he also does so with a picture, a sign that is a seal to our souls. It's part of the tradition that we just heard Paul speak of, that apostolic tradition handing off what Jesus delivered to him. Paul says, I received from the Lord what I delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave the, the Lord's Supper as an ordinance to be observed by His church until He returns. He gave it to, uh, to comfort us, to strengthen us uh, together as we proclaim the Lord's death. He died for me. He died for you. We are family. He loves us all. That's what this is all about, dining at the Lord's table as we remind one another of the benefits of Christ and cling to them by faith as they're presented to us in the supper. We're not re-sacrificing Christ here. There's no need for that. His sacrifice was sufficient once for all. But it's not a mere memorial of that either. This is something that Christ has given us as a means of grace to encourage us uh, and strengthen our faith. He does so through the Holy Spirit as we engage this by faith, as we take hold of Him by faith in the supper. He strengthens us in our warfare against sin and in our endeavors to serve Him in holiness. The, uh, the bread uh, represents the, the body given for us. The blood represents, uh, the wine rep- or the juice represents the blood shed for us. And in this sacrament, God confirms that He's faithful and true to fulfill the promises of His covenant. So He calls us to a deeper gratitude for our salvation to a renewed consecration, determination to get rid of the sinful ways in us and pursue holiness, to be more faithfully obedient. Supper is also a bond and a pledge of of this union that we have, this family union that we have with one another. For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Supper anticipates the the consummation of the ages when we will all be gathered at the wedding, wedding supper of the Lamb. And, uh, and we know that no one will ascend God's holy hill except those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who do not lift up their soul to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. So as we come to the Lord's table, we humbly resolve to deny ourselves, to crucify the sin that remains within us, to resist the evil one, and to follow Christ like those who bear his name ought to, pursuing holiness. So if you've received Christ Jesus as your Lord, you're resting on him alone and his finished work for your salvation, and you are uh, baptized and professing communicant member in good standing at a church that professes the gospel of God's free grace in Christ, and if you are living penitently, if you are uh, seeking to walk in godliness, not perfectly, but seeking to walk in godliness before the Lord, then this supper is for you. And I invite you in Christ's name to eat the bread and drink the cup. At the same time, God's Word said, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty. And so if you are not trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior... If you aren't yet a communing member in good standing of a faithful church, or even if you are, but you have something against your brother, there's division in the body, and and you're not right with your brother or with the Lord, then I warn you in the name of Christ not to eat of the supper. Now, that warning is not aimed to keep those who have a really sensitive soul from partaking. None of us are perfect. That's why he gives it to us. This is medicine for sick poor sinner souls. So come and receive refreshing as we take from the Lord's Supper. Will you pray with me? Oh, Father, we do praise you for the wonder of your salvation. We, we see in it your power. We see in it your wisdom. We see in it your goodness and your mercy. Father, we confess that we can't stand before you or enjoy your heavenly feast on our own merits. We owe everything to you. and We wholly lean on our Savior Jesus Christ, on his finished work, on his continuing intercession as he sits at your right hand and pleads for us. Oh, Father, we have nothing to offer you but our bodies. As sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving, we ask that you would 
take them, take our bodies, take our will, and, and bend it toward your holiness. Fill us with your Spirit, Lord, that we might walk faithfully with you, that we might be sanctified, transformed by your grace. Let us live holy lives amidst a dark and twisted generation. Father, use this bread and this cup to strengthen us. Allow us by faith to feed upon Jesus Christ, crucified and risen for us, that being strengthened by His grace, we might live in Him and for Him. For the sake of Christ, we pray and in His name. Amen.